So um, I'm going to be telling you a little bit about a network uh, looked at in the other direction, that is inside the cell. Um, but interestingly, many of the same challenges of analysis of the network, of trying to relate it to experiments, of coming up with efficient modeling techniques, uh, they crop up uh, in this direction as well. And I'll try to make the case that uh, modeling of this kind and uh, data of this kind are just as important for understanding uh, brain computations. Uh, next slide, please. So um, this is a, a take on a very, very old slide, a very familiar one to many of you, which is that the brain uh, works and computes at many levels, starting at the bottom from molecules up through synapses, dendrites, neurons, circuits, area systems, and behavior. Um, and of course, as I already said, we'll be looking primarily at the lower end of this scale. So if you can go to the next slide. So here is the scale, which uh, perhaps is the uh, overall goal of what many of us would like to understand. And uh, in the last talk, uh, you got perhaps a little bit of a glimpse of recordings, which operate maybe not at this entire scale, but certainly hit many of the primary regions at this scale. Now, if you look at uh, down towards the, the bottom right, you'll see where a typical neuron uh, size is compared to uh, the overall structure. And we're going to go down, yes, there, uh, next slide, please, to that uh, zoom in and uh, roughly 100 times uh, uh, more magnification. And now you have a typical neuron. This is a, a beautiful model of a Purkinje neuron uh, modeled by Eric de Schutter. And uh, so a lot of the stuff that you've been seeing has been looking at phenomena at this scale. So now we're going to zoom in uh, to the little spot on the, on the bottom left. Uh, next slide, please. And so another hundredfold uh, magnification. And this is a, a lovely uh, EM study by uh, Christian Harris and collaborators. And um, here you're seeing uh, in yellow, a small region of dendrite. And the little red spots that you see on it are uh, individual synapses. Um, and it's an incredibly densely packed uh, uh, piece of tissue. And uh, in this uh, symposium, you will be hearing a lot more about uh, analysis of connections based on such data. Now let's zoom in another time to the size of a single synapse. Uh, so uh, uh, next slide, please, tenfold uh, finer. And uh, this is a single uh, dendritic bouton. This is, sorry, it's, uh, a synaptic bouton, the presynaptic side. The postsynaptic side is about the same size and equally messy. Um, what you're seeing here is about half a micron across. And it is utterly packed with proteins and vesicles and microtubules and uh, many, many other things. At the bottom of it, you can see in uh, bright red is the uh, synaptic release zone. But what I want you to think about is that each of these little strings and blobs uh, of protein in this structure are computational elements. And that is the kind of perspective I would like to uh, take you through in the coming uh, few slides. Uh, next slide, please. Okay, so there's a set of equations which I inflict upon students in my class, uh, which uh, sort of goes from one scale to the other, well, somewhere from one scale to the other. And these are the standard equations that uh, most of you will be totally familiar with. Um, there's, uh, at the top, you have a standard equation for synapses, there's the hodgkin huxley equation, Scable equation, Nernst equation. Uh, closer down to the bottom, you have the diffusion equation. And then you have a bunch of equations dealing with uh, chemistry. And uh, what I always find fascinating is that this relatively small set of equations uh, goes an enormously long way to account for and describe uh, the phenomena that uh, we are talking about in this entire symposium. In other words, a lot of the phenomenology comes out of this relatively small set of equations. Uh, you've been listening to the ones that pertain to the ones maybe on the upper half. And I'll be telling you a little bit more about the ones in the lower half. Uh, next slide, please. 
Okay, so uh, back to our uh, computational element. And so what we're going to explore is the network within the neuron, the network within the synapse and dendrite. Uh, in other words, the network of signaling pathways of chemistry of molecules interacting. Next slide, please. So here is a, a paper that came out uh, some 10 years ago now. Uh, which sort of illustrates the scale of the problem. Um, yes, it's complicated when you go to large networks, but it's also very, very complicated inside each cell, in fact, inside each synapse. So there's 1,400 known proteins just in the postsynaptic zone of, this, uh, of the human postsynaptic density, uh, as illustrated in this uh, nice study by Seth Grant and collaborators. And the point here is that just like one needs to characterize and analyze and learn about the properties of each of the different neuronal classes. Uh, if you want to understand the computations happening inside the cell, uh, you probably need to have a similar depth of understanding for all of these characters, the 1400 or so proteins, and how they interact with each other. So it is a very, very non-trivial network. Uh, next slide, please. So here is a network that I worked on many years ago. Uh, I estimate it's about 0.1% of what is in there. Uh, but these may be familiar pathways to many of you. Uh, on top, you have various input uh, pathways, growth factors, glutamate, uh, hormones, and regulators uh, feeding in through different kinds of receptors and then diving into the depths of second messengers and kinases and phosphatases and other nice things. So next slide. So this, was, uh, this network does an awful lot of things. And of course, this is only a small part of the network. Um, just to uh, list a few of these uh, things, there's association uh, between pre and postsynaptic activity. There's pattern selection of different kinds, uh, and I'm including different plasticity rules in this. There's the question of how you store information for a long time, uh, plasticity maintenance, there's neuromodulation, spine turnover and new connections, detection of different uh, kinds of organization of input, uh, other things like load balancing, how do you ensure that different parts of the cell get enough nutrients? For that matter, how do you ensure that different parts of the brain get enough nutrients? Different kinds of logistics and housekeeping. And then the very non-trivial but often ignored computations of development, repair, the recovery from disease, and so on. Uh, next slide. So here, what we have is what I would say are sort of the classical uh, standard computational uh, functions listed in blue. Um, not to say that the ones at the bottom are any less complicated or computationally intensive, but uh, we probably don't think about them quite as much, uh, in, in, certainly in the kinds of context that we will be discussing in this uh, uh, conference. Next slide, please. So here is one of the computations that you're probably all quite familiar with. This is a standard STDP uh, curve, spike timing dependent plasticity. And what this is, is uh, a molecular computation that recognizes patterns in time. Uh, next slide. So as that's one example of a computation uh, done by chemistry. Here's another one. Uh, this is uh, the BCM rule. Uh, many of you are familiar with this. An absolutely standard way of understanding uh, how you can have bidirectional plasticity, uh, how this depends on context. In fact, this was even proposed uh, in a very, very abstract form and has been now seen in physiological preparations. And this uh, interesting bidirectional effect, in other words, you use a single stimulus which can have opposing effects. In other words, strengthening the synapse or weakening it, depending on the strength of the input, in this case, calcium. And this can be implemented in uh, this very, very simplified, oversimplified diagram to the right. Uh, with just a few reactions, you can implement uh, the BCM curve and therefore, thereby in some ways going full circle, right? We started out with a very theoretical perspective on, on how the BCM curve applies to networks. And now we've dived into a much deeper network within every synapse uh, to come up with a way in which this curve could be implemented using biochemistry. Uh, next slide, please. Here's one of my favorite kinds of computations that uh, happens in synapses. Uh, by stability, which is uh, obviously, as all of you know, related to memory. So um, what you have is uh, on the top left, you have a standard feedback circuit of chemicals, but 
you know, conceptually, it's no different from a feedback circuit uh, implemented in logic gates. A activates B, B activates A, it goes round in circles. Um, and you could, in principle, sustain activity uh, depending on whether they were in a high or low state. Okay, what, what do we do next? Well, supposing you're a chemist, what you might do is you might say, I'm interested in analyzing the effect of B upon A. So I eliminate the upper arrow uh, in the middle chart, and then I plot the dose response curve with the blue line that is A versus B, and I get some typical sigmoid, which is characteristic of a chemical system. And I can do this the other way around. I can ask what is the influence of A upon B. So far, so good. Uh, but those of you who are familiar with analysis of state diagrams, these are two steady state curves. What ha where, is it, uh, where is the system stable? Well, you flip them over so that you are plotting them on the same axis. And the intersection point defines a stable point. And if the curves are shaped just right, you can have multiple intersection points, as you can see in the graph on the bottom right. And so you have a uh, lower intersection point, a middle point, and, a, and an upper point. And the two extreme points, the lower and upper points, are stable. And the one in the middle is like a transition point, which is a threshold uh, from, for flipping from one state to another. And this is a bistable system. What can you do with this? Next slide, please. What you can do with this is you can withstand a turnover, which is actually a really complicated and difficult challenge for uh, synapses. How is it possible that your uh, synapses can retain information for years, maybe a whole lifetime, even though the individual molecules have a lifetime typically of the order of a day. Well, this is how it could happen. Uh, let's take our uh, little feedback circuit, A and B, the triangles, uh, feeding into the, into the octagons. Uh, so it can be in a resting state, or on the right-hand side, it can be in the active state. And just take it down one level to looking at the individual molecules involved, so a stimulus can cause the transition of a whole bunch of molecules from resting state to, upper, to active state. Next slide, please. So now let's embed these in a bunch of spines. That's what these uh, funny mushroom-shaped objects are meant to be. So here's our population uh, to the left, uh, where we have a bunch of these molecules are feeding back into each other, maintaining their state that way. But because of turnover, a few of them die. Those are the crosses. A few of them vanish from the cell. And in the next uh, dendritic spine, you'll see that there's gaps where they, where they used to be. Now, of course, if this process continued, you would lose all of the molecules, your memory would fade away, and that would not be very nice. But of course, the cell is alive, new molecules are being made, they're being synthesized, and they uh, come into uh, the, uh, the, the spine and uh, now start to participate in the reactions. And now you get another uh, fully equipped set of molecules in the synapse to sustain the information. So, yeah, so, uh, so next slide, please. So what else can you do with this? Um, here's a, a computation that we're very interested in. Supposing you had an input propagating along the uh, length of a dendrite, yeah, a sequence of inputs. Um, so this could trigger activity in successive regions, uh, successive spines, and uh, can we detect the sequence uh, going in one direction or another? Next slide, please. So the answer is yes, you can. Uh, here's a, a static picture. Um, the top panel shows uh, what happens if you pre present the sequence in the correct direction. And the bottom panel is what happens if the sequence is project presented in some scrambled direction, some other direction, where there's no sequence at all. Uh, uh, next slide, please. So here we have an animation of this. The blue curve is the sequential. Uh, the sequential stimulus, and the red curve is the one where it's presented in some random order. And I hope that this is coming across clearly. Uh, but what you can see is that the blue curve uh, builds up very, very nicely uh, as the sequence progresses, whereas the red curve sort of models along at the bottom of the, of the chart. So in other words, this chemical system is sequence selected. Uh, next slide, please. So these are kinds of computations that are happening uh, through uh, the chemical network, which I've already introduced to you. Uh, next slide. But 
Now let's sort of shift gears and think a little bit about how we actually do the modeling. So this slide is one of my old favorites. Uh, I worked on this as a postdoc many uh, centuries ago. Um, and this is a, you know, an old and much, much smaller model than uh, what we use now, of course. Uh, next slide. What we use now is about five times bigger, uh, still modeling the synapse. If you try and, it's much too complicated to show in the same way, but if you try and zoom in, uh, we try to make like a Google Earth type animation here. If you try to zoom in on the uh, different pathways, so there's some 40 different pathways in the newer model, and you can sort of see them from a distance, and you zoom in, and you can end up finally seeing the reactions that underlie uh, the, the network. Uh, next slide, please. So these are really uh, quite messy and large networks. Uh, the primary tool that we use to model these, and in fact, uh, model a lot of uh, uh, the other cellular properties and networks, is a simulator called Moose. Um, which we've been developing over several years. Um, it does many things that Neuron does. It does network level calculations, but it's also very, very uh, tuned to do a lot of calculations at the subcellular level, uh, indeed down to the level of single molecules and stochastic uh, chemistry. Uh, next slide, please. So uh, here's an example of the kinds of models that one can undertake uh, with, uh, with Moose. Um, this was a detailed uh, morphology from uh, neuromorpho.org. It has some 3,000 compartments in the original, onto which we added some 5,000 spines. Each one of these spines, each one of the compartments has some 25 reactions and molecules. And uh, uh, so e basically every single one of them is adorned with distinct uh, reactions and molecules. There's background synaptic input, there's pattern synaptic input that comes in, activates the receptors, Calcium comes in, signaling happens, channel modulation happens, and this is happening throughout the neuron. And of course, this is what happens throughout the neuron in all of the neurons in your brain. Uh, next slide, please. And so here's another animation of, the, of this uh, situation. It's actually modeling the same kinds of sequence selectivity I showed you earlier, uh, but at a much, much uh, greater level of physiological detail. Um, but the principle is the same. Uh, on the left, you have uh, the sequence selectivity and on the right we have scramble sequence which does not show much selectivity i'm not sure if it's coming across very clearly in the uh movie due to the limitations of bandwidth but uh that's that's the kind of uh computation that is happening in principle in every little piece of dendrite in every cell uh, next slide please okay so you know the point is i uh, is that being able to make these models and build them is only a very small part of the modeling workflow. And I think a lot of the, this meeting is about the workflow that it takes to build such models. And next slide. So the workflow as a whole involves all the steps here and I'll work through them uh, one by one. And next slide, please. So just to uh, give a perspective, the the simulations I showed you ran on Moose and were specified in a, uh, a sort of overlay program called R Designer uh, to define those models. But in order to have a workflow that's able to do all of these things, there's a lot of other programs that we developed uh, over the past few years and hope to start to release many of them. Some of them are already out. And I'll be telling you about these as we go along. Uh, next slide, please. So the first thing in this workflow is you have to pick a process. What is the question you're interested in? Next slide. And the, there's a number of people who have gotten together to do this. Uh, some of my colleagues are listed uh, in the bottom right. Uh, I'm particularly interested in this case in looking at autism. So we have something called autism, the autism simulation. Next slide, please. And uh, this is the problem that we are going to start with. So uh, we made a model of this. And if you go to the next slide, you'll zoom into this model. Um, this is uh, the scale of what we're looking at these days. As I said, it's about five times bigger than the model that you saw earlier, uh, with, uh, which I had done during my postdoc. And this is basically activity-driven uh, postsynaptic translation, how it's controlled through some 40 different signaling uh, uh, pathways. Now, how does one- It's 10 minutes, Upi. That's perfect, thank you, Gautam. Uh, next slide, please. Uh, 
So how does one get the model right? And I think this is sort of the underlying core theme of much of this workshop. How, does, how, do, how do you fit it to the data? How do you know that what you fit is actually one of the general solutions rather than some really weird niche case which may not be a good representation of reality? Uh, next slide. So you get tons and tons and tons of data. Um, and uh, what we did, because uh, the kinds of biochemical uh, readings that we need uh, have not necessarily yet been done in one place, uh, we went to the literature and created now some closer to 300 uh, different experiments, of which you're seeing about 20 or 30 on your, on your screen. Um, and these are all referring to some small parts, some small sets of reactions maybe, or maybe uh, big uh, leaps from the input to a middle stage in the pathway. Um, this is in fact, I would say, a really uh, right place for a, a systematic effort using some of the modern high throughput techniques, um, such as the, you know, the Allen Institute has brought to bear on uh, things like connectomics and looking at cellular physiology. Well, here is another whole kind layer of networks which I think is just begging to be analyzed in that same kind of systematic manner. And we hope that uh, we'd be able to do some of this uh, in, uh, in years to come. So anyway, we have this whole bunch of models. Next slide, please. Sorry, a whole bunch of experiments and we've uh, curated them. And these are uh, being assembled in the database, which is coming onto something called FindSim Web, uh, where uh, we are uh, going to incorporate not just the, uh, the models and the uh, software for analyzing them, but also the data that are used to generate, uh, that are used to uh, constrain the models. Uh, next slide. So now we have the model and we have tons of data and we now need to make the model more accurate. Uh, next slide, please. So we have a optimization pipeline, and as you gathered from the previous talks, this is a very non-trivial process. So of course we use Moose to run the big models, but we also have developed something called Hiltau, which is a very, very fast way of running reduced models, uh, which we can use as a scaffold to help us get to get to the more detailed model. It's an abstraction, if you like, of the chemistry. There's FindSim, which codifies the experiments, FindSim Web, and then we have a hierarchical optimization technique and so on. So there's many, many layers to doing this uh, calculation. Uh, next slide. What I'll do is I'll sort of give you, indicate a flow chart and then I'll run you through some of the steps of optimization. So what do you need? You need your model, that's to the upper left. Uh, in the middle, you need to do something, some experiment. You need to deliver some stimulus to the biological tissue or to the model. And then to the right, you need to know what is the outcome of those experiments. So all of these are codified in uh, a standard format, in a JSON format, uh, which comprises our, which each elements of which comprise our database. It goes to our simulator, which could be Moose, it could be uh, Hiltau, it could be any other simulator for that matter. Um, you run the simulation, uh, you compare it with the experimental outcome, and that gives you a score. And then you can close the loop and go back uh, to optimize the model uh, for the next step. Uh, next slide, please. So I'll just march you through a series of slides here. Different kinds of stimuli are possible. You can give time series stimulations, which is what you're all familiar with in the biochemical domain or the electrical domain, if you like. Next slide. Um, you can give dose response curves. This is a much beloved by biochemists. Next slide, please. You can do bar charts where you have different combinations of inputs and outputs. Next slide, please. You can do standard electrophysiology, current clamp, voltage clamp, and so on. Uh, next slide. Yeah, skipping over various things, you can even do standard LTP, uh, EPSCP kinds of experiments, and all of these can be codified and used to optimize the model. Uh, next slide, please. And you run it through optimization, and sure enough, uh, after you turn the handle and compute for a long time, you end up with a better fitting model. Note that this is real data and it's very diverse data, so you can't always fit everything. Um, that's why it would be nice to have a single coherent uh, data set done under the same conditions. Uh, next slide, please. So we've gone through this whole process. We've built our model. We've 
gotten data, we've optimized the model to fit the data, and now we use the model. Next slide, please. And there are many uses that one can put to the model. Uh, here we're using it to play with uh, the fragile X syndrome, uh, which is one of the major causes of autism. We know that there are certain level differences uh, between wild type and fragile X protein expression. Uh, those are the molecules marked in yellow. Uh, we can simply put those into the model and ask what happens to the signaling. Um, and this is a uh, very much work in progress. Uh, next slide, please. So um, what I've tried to do is to give you a glimpse of this whole hierarchy of tools uh, from the simulator to different ways of uh, codifying experiments and comparing them with the, the model, uh, optimization techniques, ways of uh, reducing models, and then, of course, very importantly, the data itself. Next slide, please. The key thing is, and I'm sure this has already come up and will keep coming up, all of this is open source, we work with standards, Python, SPML, NeuroML, all our files are specified in JSON, we take files from Neuromorpho, so that this is really meant to be interchangeable. You don't have to use Moose, you could use Neuron, you could use some other simulator that does the biochemistry well uh, to do the same kinds of calculations. Um, the idea is that the conversion from data to model should be as explicitly laid out, as reproducible as any other step in the modeling process. You should be able to download the data and use it, maybe tweak it in your own favorite way to come to your own version of the model. Next slide. Okay, so this is the approach that we are taking to understand how the brain works, uh, perhaps at a slightly finer scale, but no less intricate, no less of a complicated network. I think uh, equally important in terms of, of computation, perhaps even more important when it comes to thinking about uh, diseases and other maybe practical, quote unquote, applications of studying the brain. Uh, next slide. So with that, I'd like to end. I, of course, thank some of the key players, Harsha, Anisha, and Surbit. Uh, various other people who have come through the lab, uh, through the GSOC, INCF, uh, and uh, Supercomputing Gateway, uh, collaborators, consortium members, and funding. Thank you very much. Excellent. Thanks. Thanks, Upi. So I actually like to answer, ask a question myself, because I mean, typically when you model neurons and neuron dynamics and synapses, uh, we use this, what we call like phenomenological models or s statistical models for, for synapses where we have STDP and, and these things, right? And so, uh, so how, when does this approach break down and when do you have to start? So how, yeah, so can you say something general about that? Right, I mean, so yeah, I mean, you can put in, uh, you know, your standard phenomenological curves, but the moment you want to put in uh, drugs, uh, the moment you want to relate them to mutations that have a disease uh, effect, then you immediately have to now start thinking about what do these curves, what do ph these phenomenological models actually map to in the biology? And so this is where it's important to have uh, a more detailed model. I, I sort of went glossed over it, but we have two levels of detail. We have a sort of semi-phenomenological version, which I call the Hiltau representation, which allows you to really look at it just at the block diagram level. Think of them as your rate neurons uh, of the signaling pathway. And then we have the seriously detailed version, which is looking at the individual molecules and the chemical steps. And if you want to get insanely detailed, you can uh, talk to all my colleagues uh, uh, who have developed Smolden, Steve Andrews, or, uh, or uh, Tom Bartol uh, with M-cell, and they will look at individual molecules bouncing around uh, in three dimensions. So you can look at it at whatever level uh, is necessary. Um, but I think that the mapping to experiments, to drugs, to molecules is uh, very often uh, crucial to understanding things. Another quick question from uh, Koya Morales Veil uh, to Upi. How, how, how does the word, how, worse, how well does the model with two different time scales work, like by physical properties in milliseconds and the biochemical pathway, which is like seconds to minutes. Uh, okay, I'm not quite sure how you, what you mean, how well does it work? Um, it's actually yeah. 
very convenient um, mm -hmm. because uh, we are able to run the chemical computations really very efficiently, mm -hmm. even if we put in the full detail of all the ODE calculations and reaction diffusion. Um, so just to put it in perspective, mm -hmm. that very detailed cell model, which had uh, 5,000 spines, it took longer to simulate one cell, the electrophysiology of that one cell, than it took to simulate all of the chemistry and all of the compartments of that cell. Yeah, I see. Yeah. Then a final one. Upi, can we have access to this data? This is from Umid Resania. Yeah, of course. As I said, we, you know, we're uh, committed to open source and uh, open access. We're just starting to, we're, in fact, in a few days, hopefully we'll have at least some of the, the uh, papers uh, out on BioArchive telling you about the Hiltau form. And uh, we have some of the data already out there on the FindSim site. So uh, all of it will become available as we go along. Yes.